Hello and welcome back to my channel. Um, if you're new here, my name's Nick and today we are going out to Hill Sandfort. So um, I'll just give you a quick view of where we're going. I've got uh, Mike from MKMD Exploration and Paranormal, so go check his channel out. So yeah, up in the distance there, I don't know if you can make it out. If you follow the red markers, it's at the end, but it's about three miles up there. We're on Cleefort Beach at the moment and we've got rain coming in got a bit of a swell so I might have a bit of trouble launching um, we've got a lot of gear with us today but we've been trying to get out to well Hail Sandfort we've been out there once before on a recce mission a few months ago about four months ago now and um, yeah we're going out now to document it in um, a lot better detail Hello, so we've made it to uh, Hill Sandfort. What I will say is though, um, I don't mind being out of my comfort zone a little bit, but that was super sketchy. Um, I do not recommend people trying to get over to this port. Um, obviously I can't stop you, but um, please do listen, it's not worth the risk. Um, I'm going to document it today, so you don't really need to come out. Um, but yeah, anyway, let's uh, get this video started. Yeah, I've had to put the boat on there. The boat did flood. Um, the tide is going out now. But yeah, it was super sketchy going through that chop. Um, I don't know. I think the boat might be a little bit too close to the water, too low down. Could have done with some bigger, a bigger boat, like bigger tubes maybe. But anyway, this is the landing stage. Um, this is original from when it was first built. And um, this was built actually at the cost of £944 back in 1917. Well, between 1915 and 1918. Whenever they worked out the cost, it was £944. So yeah, the last time we came out, that door was not open. So someone's either come out and opened, broke it open, or it was just open and we didn't try it. We actually went through a window on the other side. Um, but yeah, if you do come out here, you know, this fort's been here over just over 100 years, 105 years or so, 110. Please don't come out and damage it. It's an important piece of history for the uh, Humber. I mean, I don't think a lot of people know, like, how defended the Humber was from, like, the First World War up until the Cold War. Well, until 1956. Um, heavily defended was the estuary. So um, work commenced on the fort on the 22nd of May 1915 and it was finally completed on the 31st of March 1918. There's three searchlight emplacements on the fort. Um, this one here made out of steel and concrete. That was, that's original to the fort when they first built it. This one here is a World War II add-on. This was installed in April 1942. Um, and these will have a big searchlight so they can scan the water for any uh, enemy shipping coming in, small vessels. And then you've got your third emplacement, and that's also original when it was first built. So yeah, as I said, you've got three there. That's the installed one in uh, 1942. And they're from like 1915 to 1918 when the fort was built. So uh, in the distance there we've got the sister fort which is Bull, 
Um, I was going to go there today after here, but I'm not risking my life for it. And I, I think Mike's in agreement. It's just not worth the. Uh, it's just not worth the risk. So from Hale Sandfort to Bull, it's 2.25 miles away. I mean, it doesn't look that far, does it? Really, when you're looking there now. But yep, 2.25 miles. Um, and Hill is located just under a mile from the Lincolnshire coast. So here we are, that's the window that we, me and Mike went through last time. Mike has to cut all his finger open. So here we have the base. There was uh, six cooling tanks at the fort. And this is where four of them were placed. So you've got one, two, three, four. Um, and each could hold 550 gallons. So yeah, four outside and then two inside. So the fort's role in the Humber Defence Scheme was to prevent hostile MTBs and small craft from entering the southern channel of the Humber Estuary. Um, MTBs is motor torpedo boats um, and small craft, you, you can work that one out. So yeah, this played a very important role over the years. But um, let me get some light in and we will head inside. Yeah, so before we go inside, I forgot to tell you, that's the inspection chamber for the drainage. All the drainage for the fort comes out of there. Um, and that's where you could inspect to make sure they weren't blocked or whatever. And then that would drain off into the sea. So yeah, let's head inside. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to head to the seaward side of the fort, of the uh, boiler room, and we'll start there. So I do have a hell of a lot of documentation for the fort. This has taken months of planning and research to come out here. So yeah, this is the, uh, this is the boiler room. Looks like someone else actually came in here before because that box wasn't there when me and Mike came in. No. Bit of skin diving, that's where I cut my finger. How lovely. Oh, I can't believe we don't have a first aid kit. I know. Just be careful not to get it over. Not like me to come on, on. Have you got some rags or something you can rip up and. Don't have it. Really don't know. Um, did I bring my drag bag in? Fuck, I might have some in there. Um, so yeah, I believe in uh, the Second World War, there was another cooling tank there, but they got rid of that and just kept the one on the inside. So in here would have been the boiler. Your heater unit was there. That's the coal cellar. Um, I might try and lift that up shortly. So it looks like someone has lifted it up. But yeah, that's a coal cellar and that could hold 80 tonnes of coal. So also in the boiler room, you've got the shower baths and then the shower baths. You even got the original coat hangers there. Yeah, look, as you can see, it's got, well, it would have had a little plug. And yeah, I've not, I've not seen these before. This is original from the First World War when it was built. So you've got three of those. This is just amazing in here. I mean, I, I can't believe how much is still left. I mean, people say that it's it's in a bad state, but I don't believe it is. Considering its location in the sea, in the sea air and stuff, I mean, it's got its original paint. You know, there's a lot of features left still in here. So yeah, this is the engine room. Um, you've got all your temperature gauges, well, where your temperature gauges and stuff would have been. Light fitting there, light fitting up there. This is where your workshop benches would have been. All your tools on the racks up there, on the holders. That's the telephone box so the troops, the soldiers could call back home. And that's original as well from the, well from when it was first built. There's no telephone in there now obviously. 
Yeah, there's a lot of glass, but it's just remarkable the condition of it. Um, and originally, that was actually placed in that corner there. Because when me and Mike came the first time, I thought to myself, it looks like a, a telephone box. And I didn't have the plans or any of the documents at the time. But then I thought, why would it be in the engine room? I thought, surely it must have been moved. But no, originally it was in that corner over there, so it's always been in the engine room. Um, and these actual engines in here would have been running all the time anyway because they just powered the batteries. The fort was actually one-off cells, um, batteries. And these generator sets, these engines, they just powered that. And um, if the searchlights had to go on, then these would kick in. So, yeah, all the... Um, extra power that the searchlights didn't need would power the batteries and the fault would actually run off, off batteries. So yeah, this is your uh, heating. Half of the fault was heated, mainly the, all the accommodation area. Um, but yeah, my document that I've printed off to bring in about the engines has got all wet. But originally, when it was first constructed, there was two um, two engines in here. And then during the Second World War, they put four in. There was four list of 24 kilowatt um, sets. I don't really know what to call them. Generators, engines. Um, that's original from the Second World War. There would have been four of those tanks, and they'd have been against that wall there. But yeah, it's just remarkable, the, the condition in here, really. I mean, you can still smell, like, the oil and stuff. I mean, you can see it all. But it's got that smell to it, so... That must be part of one of the engines that been stripped a long time ago. Must have been taken bit by bit, unless the army did it when they left. Which I believe they left in 1956. As they have documents up until that year, and then there's nothing. So I think they left in... 56. Anyway, let's move on to the next room. Actually, before we leave, I did forget to mention that um, the fort had its own artesian well, um, and that's the pump there for it. So that was an electric pump, um, and the depth of that is 145 feet below the floor level of the fort, or 126 and a half foot below the riverbed. Um, and it was a six inch diameter borehole, I believe, according to the documents. So yeah, and that would operate on a float system. Um, the water tanks would be on the roof, and they had a total capacity of 2,370 gallons. Um, and when they got low, it would automatically kick in and fill the tanks up on the roof there. And that pump actually was capable of delivering 400 gallons of water an hour. So, quite a good pump is that one. Plenty of water for the needs of the fort. Yeah, it's just incredible to see, see all this still in here. Fantastic. It's like a time capsule. Fire extinguisher bracket. So yeah, moving on. We've got the accommodation areas. So there's one accommodation area, two, and three. We'll come back to them in a second. So that's where we just were, in the engine room. So here we've got a hand pump. I think that could be for the oil. I'm not too sure. Unless it was a backup pump for the well. Um, the pipe does go up there. But I've not seen that on the plans. I'm not too sure what that's for. That could have been installed later on in the 50s during the Cold War. Because it is that type of area. Um, they had those type of pumps in the ROC posts. 
But yeah, this is the battery room. This is where the engines are the generators in the engine room. The batteries would have been stored on these shelving units here, look. Oldham, Manchester. See, the batteries are all stored along there. And like I said, the batteries would have provided power to the fort. The engine's main purpose was for the searchlights. Yeah, there's a tiled floor in there, probably for battery acid and stuff like that. It's a bit of a tight gap, isn't it? So let's go and have a look in the uh, accommodation areas. Oh, this is fantastic, this. This is the original sign here. Know your fire points. First floor, second floor, and gun floor. So speaking of gun floor, the fort was armed with four inch guns, two of them. Um, later on, it was changed to six inch guns, twin mounted, so there would have been four. But yeah, this is one of the accommodation areas. So there's three barrack rooms on the ground floor and three on the second floor. Um, and in wartime, this could accommodate 60 NCOs and then, well, plus the officers. So you've got uh, four down bunk beds and there would have been a few hammocks strung up as well in here. But this is all original as well. This is the, like your, uh, I don't know, your kit lockers. So you put your kit in the top there, you would have had a shelf. And underneath you've got a place where your boots can go. It's just really good to see. There's your heater again up there. And as well as heating, it could also provide um, air conditioning. Um, the fort is made out of uh, steel and concrete. Um, it's got half an inch of bulletproof steel on the outside, then concrete and then steel again. So moving on. Here we go, we can't forget that. That's your rifle rack. So you could come in, kick your boots off, put your rifle in its rack and jump in your pit. Just need to be careful not to miss anything. Because I am not going back out here again. The first time we came out on kayaks and uh, well that ended badly too. I thought having a boat would have been a lot better. Yeah, I mean, the condition, considering where we are, it, it's fantastic. There you go, look, you've got another rifle right there, that's for two rifles. Got beds, two, four, six. So you've got six beds there. There would have been more, they've been stripped out at some point. More of the heating ducked in up there. More of your uh, kit lockers. Cut hooks on the side. This is really good. So I'll head into the third barrack room. There were a couple of cut hooks there. Actually looks like there was, these beds were in freeze. Going by the hooks there. So here we go, cut hooks again. Then you've got your uh, rifle rack. And that one's got the butt plate at the bottom where the butt of the rifle would go into. This is fantastic to see is this. It's just amazing. I mean, look at that paintwork. How cool is that? You gotta think this is located in the sea. You got the sea air. The condition is just, I don't know. You, you know what I mean. 
you've got another kit locker and inside there you've got one of the rifle rack butt plates more beds heating and air conditioning unit ventilation and stuff you've got something there and I'm not too sure what they're off Yeah, you can see more beds stacked there, so they would have been bolted to the wall and they've just been taken off at some point. Mike's just going around and getting photos. Um, he's happy with the first video we did. So that's where we started inside, that's the boiler room with the shower baths. These are your free accommodation areas. You've got that original sign which I love. It's only on wood and it's, it's still in good condition, but it just needs a wipe. I mean, it started to peel a little bit, but. But yeah, that door was open when we got here, so I will shut it before we leave. You've got some of the heating look. So yeah, the, the heating run about halfway through the fort. Mainly the accommodation and the, and the sleeping accommodation and the canteen and stuff and speaking of the canteen that was the canteen just in there don't know if there's anything in there there's a lot of building materials but actually that's part of the ammunition lift that's the ammunition lift is that it's a shame I can't get in there and have a look at that No, I'm not going to be able to. But anyway, so as we've just spotted the ammunition lift, I might as well talk about that. So the ammunition lift's there. Well, the bottom of it would have been there where all that stuff is, but it's been taken out when it's over there, like I've just shown you. Looks like that's been boarded up at some point. But yeah, the ammunition lift, it was uh, had an oak floor. It was hand-operated, and it could carry 300 pounds of ammunition, and it was six foot square and three... 3.5 foot high um, and it goes all the way up to the underside of the battery command post and have three sets of doors one on each floor I've already showed you that that was the um, battery room now in that door which is locked that's where the borehole is for the artesian well um, and it was also a store I think that was the Royal Engineer store in there. This is also another store room. But during the Second World War, this was actually used as the guard room. It, it changed around during the different times. I didn't actually know that I had the Second World War plans until I spotted them last night, well, late last night. So I've not had time to go through them properly yet. This is the uh, toilet area. So you've got one toilet down there, and one up there. The original Burlington brand. Never heard of them before. And another one, and I don't know why, no matter where you go, these abandoned places, the toilets are always broken. So yeah, that's this room done. Um, you Rhino just there. So anyway, moving on. That's the main entrance. Obviously, that's where we came through. So in peacetime, all these shutters on the outside of the fort and these blast doors would have been open. Um, these are the original doors. This would have been your normal doors. During normal peacetime. So only during war, they would have actually shut those blast doors. You've got the control panel for all the switching in the fort. And a little fun fact for you actually. Um, there was 85 lights within the fort and there were 64 switches. Got fire extinguisher racks. Just trying not to miss anything. So 
So we could do with trying to climb over there, really. So just give me a couple of seconds and we will get in there. So here we are, just climbed over that bags of cement or whatever it is. And inside we have a workshop table. Or maybe for prefer, prefer or maybe for preparing your food. And here we have one of the uh, cookers. I will write down on the screen now which cooker that is because that's original from when the fort was first built. You have a sink. And um, that must be some sort of boiler or something like that. I don't know what that is. Let me know down in the comments there if you know. This must have been added on later on. yeah so next door we've got the bathroom looks like we're a towel hanger movie dishcloth yeah, this next one's going to be a bit trickier so we're in the next room now there we go we've got the heating again yeah there's an original sign bath Hang your towels up there, maybe. Are your coats? And it's just an empty room. But the paintwork is just in such good condition. I just can't get over the condition. Just for its location, it's just. Don't know. There's one of you. Switches. So yeah, I'll just climb out of here and then we'll head upstairs. So heading up onto the second floor. Yeah. Oh, these stairs are a bit sketchy. See up on this floor you've got three more accommodation areas, you've got the magazine, the officer's mess, uh, the cookhouse. So where should we start? I suppose down here. So you've got a little star room there. Full of bird crap up here. I mean there's years and years of it. This star's uh, sealed unfortunately. Yeah, this is one of the accommodation areas. Got more coat hooks up there. That's where your uh, rifle rack would have been. Um, you've actually got a base for a pot belly stove there. Never actually seen one of them before and they're quite rare to be honest. To actually see one of the stoves still in situ. Got your view out there. These have got bigger kit lockers up here. More like a wardrobe, isn't it? I think this was the officer's accommodation. Didn't bring the uh, plans with me today. I do have them on my phone, but I think I'm in a bit of a rush now. I just want to get back off this fort and get in with the sea conditions the way they are. There's your uh, rifle racks. So th there's a difference in these final two accommodation areas. If you'll see, there's a room there. And there's the uh, door for it. And each of these emplacements consists of two chambers. Um, you've got a chamber for the light, the searchlight, and you've also got a chamber for one of the um, troops to 
sleep in there. There's always be one on duty. And I've just noticed, don't know if you can make that out, it says number three EMP. Yeah, that's fantastic. Oh, does this door open? Oh, it does. Perfect. So this would be a little bedroom for the guy on duty. You've got like a, a trap door there. I don't know what that is. But yeah, this is where your search site would have been. Um, it was built of bulletproof steel. Um, and yeah, and it had the accommodation for one chap. I suppose he might have liked it, having his own little space, being on duty on the searchlight. They've got one of the blast-proof type lights. Let's see if we can see what this is. Ah, so that's all your uh, second. So that's where all the power cables would have come in and I suspect that's what those holes are for down underneath the emplacements. So yeah, that was the uh, searchlight emplacement. So moving on to the next room, and yeah, the um, searchlights would have protected northeast and eastwards. That door's uh, sealed up, and the same as that one. So we can't look into the final two emplacements. And this was the officer's mess originally when it was first built. Large room, fire extinguisher holder there, coat hooks. Um, believe it or not, there was two servants that worked in this fort as well. And they were running around after the officers. Um, and this partition wall here, that was put in during the Second World War. I, saw, I definitely saw that on the plans last night when I had a quick look through. But yes, that's just a partitioned wall. And... Um, I will put down on the screen now what this room was for and what it was used for during the Second World War. Mainly what we're talking about today is from the time the fort was constructed up until the Second World War. So I'll put down below what this room was during the Second World War because I can't remember myself. And I think this room could have changed during the Second World War as well to a different role. Um, but you can see it's all been wood lined out for the officers. And it's got to be nice for them, hasn't it? So yeah, those doors are sealed up with a nut and bolt, so we can't go in there and check those other emplacements. But each emplacement was fitted with 120 centimeter projector, the uh, fortress pattern and the lights were controlled from the battery command and electric light defense post, which is next to the battery command post. Um, and then during the Second World War, I believe that they put 90 centimeter um, projectors in there. But here we have a bath. Now this one could be from downstairs, from that bathroom that I showed you, or this could be, could be from the officer's bath on this second floor. But there you've got um, part of the mechanism for the ammunition lift. And that still carries on up there. You might not be able to see up there because it is dark. Here you've got some more kit lockers. And you've got another door there leading to the outside. Um, and there was a crane 
up on the top there. And I think that was mainly to bring in shells because the um, magazine is on this floor level. So they have had two options. They could have either bought it on the lower level or they could have brought it up. For Maybe this was done later on because this isn't on the plans for many of the plans that I have about this door. So I think that could have been done a lot later on. It could have even been done during the Cold War, actually. Yeah, probably the Cold War, but I'm not sure. You've got some more fire extinguisher holders. So yeah, the only uh, firefighting appliances on the fort was buckets and uh, fire extinguishers. That's it. They've got the cookhouse for the officers. That's also sealed, I think. Oh no, it's not sealed. Does that open? There's Mike just trying to, no, just pull the door, because it's not. That won't pull, because it's got a, a thing up there. Does it go in? Like a lip that goes up, so it pushes inwards. Yeah. <clears throat> Don't think we can go in there then, can we? Can I even see in a little bit? No, there's something blocking it on the other side, probably bird crap. There's a lot of it, but yeah, there's the original sign cookhouse, and that was for the officers. You've got another storeroom. You've also got another door that seems to be locked here. And I think that was the cartridge store. So there's Mike just taking some photographs. That's his mission for today, take the photographs while I go around and record. Yep. But yeah, this is one of the um, light areas where you can put a light for the uh, shell store. Um, you wouldn't have any internal lighting that could have caused a spark. Yeah, alright then. Yeah, so there we go. And originally there was three of those ports. Or there was meant to be three. So yeah. One, two. I could have that wrong. But yeah, in that way, there'd be no lights in here that could have caused a spark and then um, detonated the shells, I suppose. But yeah, it had a capacity of a thousand shells, but then that was reduced to 884 because they decided later on to put an extra six inches of armor on the seaward side. So there was six inches of armor bolted in along that wall there and that wall there. Um, and yeah, I was looking at the plans last night and this was actually turned into the um, canteen or the mess area. Yeah, canteen I think it was. Turned into the canteen during the Second World War. So this is the most heavily armed canteen I think I've ever been in. It would have been the safest room in the fort as well. Like I say, that's the seaward side, so any shells that might have penetrated the outer skin of the fort and managed to find its way in. These soldiers would have been safe in here if they were eating at the time. Not that it really matters, this fort never sustained an attack. I'd imagine it would have got strafed though, wouldn't it, don't you? I've not, seen, an I've not seen any reports of it getting hit or anything like that. I could have sworn I'd set, I heard something or saw something about this fort being strafed by German fighters. I don't know. I might be wrong, but I, I imagine that they would, they would have had a few rounds going off with impending attacks coming. Maybe. As the German bombers and stuff were leaving, any any ammunition they had left, they could have just fired them off. Yeah. And strafed the fort, but I've, I've not seen any documents or anything like that. And there you go, you can see the armour there they've put in. That's an extra six inches of armour. So that's the most heavily armoured room in the fort. Um, and yeah, that's made up of five sheets. So going on to the next floor then. I can't believe that a lot of my documents have got soaked and ruined. My notes.
Yeah, so this is the gun floor. Or the, it would have been the gun floor, but that door's sealed up, isn't it? How does it open? It won't open, I tried it. Have you tried it, have you? Tried booting it open, but it just won't. So it's open a little bit. <clears throat> no, that's seized shut, isn't it? But yeah, that's where the gun floor is out there. Um, that's where your two guns are, but we can't get out there. So we do have a door over that side, but that is sealed as well. And a door on this side, which are both locked. Um, but that's the brick part of the structure of the fort, if you've noticed it from the drone footage. Um, and that was added on during the Second World War. Um, and one, I think this side was the recreational room and the other side, I can't remember, but I'll put that on the screen now for you. But yeah, it's definitely locked, unfortunately. Metal door. Here we have some of the doors for the ammunition lift. So the ammunition could come up and then they would go out the backside there over to the guns. And this is where all the mechanism would have been. And you've got a hatch up there to service and whatever else inspect your mechanism. And you've got a hatchway out to the outside there, which that's the way the ammunition would have gone out. You've got a little ramp, so they probably had a little trolley system that come from the magazine lift, come down here, and then outside to the guns. Making our way up to the battery command post. So yeah, I've just changed my uh, battery over, so let's head on upstairs into the battery command post. Mike said there's a lot of pigeons up here, so be careful. <laughs> There you've got the um, manhole cover to inspect the ammunition lift. And yeah, this is the battery command post. It's been divided up into two sections. But as you can see, you've got a plinth there and a plinth there. Um, you've got openings there, which are 12 inches deep. And they're, for, and they're facing seawards, it's for the observation. Um, and it's got blast shutters on the outside. So they could, be, they could be open and closed. And then in bad weather like today, the blast shutters could be open, but then you still had uh, glass on the inside so you could still stay, um, so you could still see outside, but you're also not in the weather or if it's raining or whatever. And I think that that handle there is for lifting and lowering the shutters on the outside, which work, which will not work now, so there's no point in me trying that. Yeah, let's go around the other side. Oh, wow. This is fantastic. This is what I was saying to you earlier. This is really rare to see. This is one of the pot belly stoves on its original base. That is really good to see. That is so rare. And they've got some uh, baby pigeons at the back there, but this stove, to see that still in place, it's, it's amazing. So yeah, just like the rest of the fort, the, um, Battery command post is formed of half an inch bulletproof steel plates. Um, and also, just there you've got another plinth. And in here, there would have been a Baron Stroud rangefinder, a dial table, and a chart table. And there's a telephone line to Bullsand Fort, um, and two telephone sets for the Royal Artillery Command Line, which also went to Bull and the Military Exchange at Immingham. So I'll tell you what, I'll put the telephone number up on the screen now for Bullfort. That's the original telephone number for Bullfort during the Cold War. But yeah, this is where all the equipment would have been. 
your range finder, tracking those enemy ships, anyone trying to come down into the Humber. You've got another set of doors, which I don't know what they're for. I don't know what they're for, actually. But this is amazing to see that. That's really rare, is that, Mike? It is. Make sure you get some pictures of it. So I think that during the Second World War, this was an add-on. They've cut this in and put this in. As you can see, all the edges are rougher on the edge there where they've just cut it, hacked away at it. Um, and I think they extended upwards during the Second World War, get a little bit more height. So anyway, we'll try and get onto the roof of the fort now. You do have to go through this small opening here, but we'll see you outside. So here I am on the roof of the fort now. There's Mike in there, do you want to give us a wave? There he is, look. You don't want to come outside. But yeah, this is that, all this top structure here, that's an add-on during the Second World War. Because the, the fort was never that high. The original height of the fort, the highest point was here. This was the highest point of the fort originally. Try not to do any talking around there because it's extremely windy. Got rain coming in again. To tell you the truth, I am not looking forward to going back. That was so sketchy, it's going to take us about 50 minutes to go straight across there. Um, we can't go that way because of the sandbanks. So that's the way we came with the kayaks before. But yeah, all that's sealed up and you, there's no steps going up to the top, so I would really like to see in there as well. And unfortunately, we can't get down to the gun positions. But what I will say is, if you can still hear me, that is, you've got steps there, look, going up onto the emplacements. Same as there, can you see the rungs in the concrete going up to the emplacements? Obviously the put steps in during the Second World War. These mounts were slightly modified during the Second World War. Originally four inch guns. During the Second World War, the twin mounted six inch guns. Um, and that gun there in front of us was known as Q1. known as Q2. So Q2 was installed on the 23rd of April 1917. And Q1 was installed on the 9th of April 1917. So that was the first gun to be installed just there. Um, and as I said, that's the original height of what it would have been. Um, yeah, it was modified. I mean, you can see the outer wall there. Highly modified. I might actually skip the footage to when I came the first time of up here. Um, it's just too windy and I can explain about the different modifications that they have done. So this is the coal hatch. Mike's going to attempt to lift up. Yeah, the ladder's gone, hasn't it? Yeah. But yeah, that could accommodate 80 tonnes of coal. But yeah, thank you for lifting out for me, Mike. You're so I just want to say thank you to my dad um, for helping me with funding. <laughs> For my boat and stuff to uh, get out here and document this so a big thank you to my dad for that and also thank you to mike for being as mad as me and coming out here <laughs> you're welcome what's your final thoughts it's been a tough slog it's been a big build up uh, for both me and nick uh, we spent quite a lot of money on equipment and uh, when we first came here on our kayaks 
it was a bit of a day like this and if you imagine being on a kayak in waves that what was as we encountered coming here you'd have thought you mad so and so but uh, I mean t even today just coming on Nick's boat because it's quite low down and the waves were just coming over and swamping us weren't they yeah spitting when I'm talking that horrible um, but uh, it's been a tough slog um, I, both me well I've been really really anxious about doing this because of, I used to be a former lifeboat crewman and I've seen a lot of things go down on this river. I don't mean down, but shit's gone down. So sorry about the swearing. Uh, and it gives me the anxiety and I think Nick's been feeding off that. And um, You've definitely made me a lot I'm worse. I'm sorry if it's come across like that, but you yourself, I think if you came with somebody else yeah. who was like, you know, like, it's all right, we'll just do it. Yeah. Um, you would probably have a bit more confidence, but you'd still have that anxiety still inside because of the way we was getting swamped on the way here. Yeah. And we're going to get back. Um, so that's the th worrying thing for us. We've got quite a bit of a, not a jump, but a bit of a, a height from the platform of the fort to the boat in the water. And it's a bit lumpy as I'm well. I'm not looking forward to that. I'm not, I know, but I just... Well, look what to... happened when we did that with the kayaks. We went to launch into the water from here. We ended up with barnacles and stuff all in our legs, didn't we? Yeah, we were getting we smashed were against the wall. scratches everywhere uh, from barnacles and stuff. And uh, the worst thing of all about the kayak one was we had to trundle through thick mud, towing, pulling our kayaks out of the water up to, it was a good mile and a well, we half a mile. Were, we were stuck on the beach for at least an hour and a half, oh, two hours. I'll, was... I'll put a photograph up now. Um, we got stuck and that day I just wanted to leave everything on the beach. Yeah, and just scrap it. I mean, my kayaking trolley uh, just snapped, didn't it? So we had yeah. to chuck that first time you used it, snapped. It was insane. Uh, so the next task we've got now is to get on the boat and get all the way back to Cleethorpes and hope that there's a, not too much of uh, a distance to pull the boat and, you know, trips it back to the car. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to get a nice hot shower when I get home. I have a freaking tot of whiskey, I think, as well. <laughs> yeah. I need it just to calm me nerves. But um, I would strongly suggest, from my experience of being a lifeboat crewman, nobody come out here unless you've got the right equipment, you go in the right weather conditions, you do all the updates on uh, wet Met Office, uh, all the relevant... Well, it said it was going to be fine today. Yeah, it did. That's what I mean. That's why people said that it was silly. Yeah. If you think you, it's going to be a bit iffy, don't do it. And we kind of like went past that and we got here. Just by the skin of our teeth, I think. Yeah. Because uh, uh, the boat was just getting swamped with water. I was so close to turning around, but it was quicker. It was easier to come here than it was to turn back at that point. Though, by the time I thought to myself, what the fuck have we done? Yeah, I know. And now just standing here, I'm thinking time's ticking and my nerves just, I'm, I know. My nerves are going and I think I just want to get that boat yeah. back in the water and get off here now. So anyway, well, I, that's enough from me now. I'll leave it to Nick and we're going to get back. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, so as Mike was saying, we do have a drop. Oh, we have a hell of a drop, Mike. How are we going to get the boat down that? We can't get the boat down that. Unless we get the other rope out, one on each side with rope and lower it down that way. Shit, I can't believe how much it's gone down. There's no way we can lower that down there. The back of the boat's going to get swamped. We're gonna have to, it's gonna be have to do a two-man job. I've got some more rope. Which way do you want, which side do you want to lower it at? We're gonna have to jump into it as well. Exactly. How, Same situation was in the kayaks. How are we gonna do it? I don't know, but how the hell are we gonna do that? This is what exactly what happened with the kayaks. We ended up putting the kayaks down there last time. Um, and it's about the same distance as it is now and but the sea was a bit more rough here and we got smashed against the side of the landing stage uh, we ended up with barnacles stuck in our legs all cut up bleeding everywhere how the hell are we going to lower the boat into that oh my god I think we might be stuck on here for a bit Mike but yeah um, thank you for watching I can see that seat coming in and I am a bit nervous about going back on the boat now. Um, we should never come out here really, uh, not on the boat that I have, but we're going to be fine, we're going to make it back and um, 
I hope you've enjoyed this video and if you have, don't forget to leave us a comment, leave me a like and uh, subscribe please. Like I said, I was going to go up to Bull Sandport but I'm just, I'm just not going to risk it. I mean, if you know anyone where I can charter a boat to take me a mic out there, let me know down in the comments. Um, I'd quite happily pay for someone in a, a proper sized boat to take me a mic out when the weather's a lot better. Um, I'll be doing another video over there. But yeah, thank you for watching and I'll see you all again soon.